Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and again, welcome to our first address in the 1994-95 Distinguished Speakers Program. I don't know about you, but uh, I really miss the programs during the summer, so I'm glad <laughs> that uh, the program is back. And actually, you are going to make up for the summer because we have a very busy couple of weeks coming up. Up until around a year ago, and in spite of the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, negotiations between Israel and the rest of the Arab countries were going nowhere. The question was then, when are we going to have a comprehensive peace in the Middle East? The signing of the Israeli-Palestinian agreement in Washington a year ago changed things around. It paved the way for the Israeli-Jordanian agreement. The positive signs coming out of Damascus recently would not have happened without it. As a result, there is no question that we are going to have a comprehensive peace in the Middle East. The question now is, what peace will look like? To answer that question, we have with us this evening a highly regarded authority on Middle Eastern affairs, author of 11 books, a faculty leader at the American University in Washington, a public servant, a lecturer, and, and, and an advisor to various groups, Dr. Abdelaziz Saeed. To read to you Dr. Saeed's qualifications, awards, activities, and accomplishments will take the rest of the evening. As we are all looking forward to hear his remarks, please join me in welcoming the distinguished scholar, Dr. Abdelaziz Saeed, to the Council. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shamali, and thank you, Professor Bird. My first thanks were extended to Elias Shamali and also to Professor Bird. It is good of you to invite me to be with you. And Frank, as you were talking about Haiti, Probably I may have preferred to spend this evening talking about Haiti. I am currently in the process of writing an op-ed or a small article responding to the media pundits, professional analysts, and the establishment. And essentially what I am trying to say in my brief op-ed that if we are to learn our foreign policy from them, they better get it right. <laughs> they better get it right. Jimmy Carter is not a loose cannon. Jimmy Carter is not a wild man. Jimmy Carter is not asinine. Jimmy Carter we find it difficult, they find it difficult to respond to him because they find it difficult to respond to someone who operates from a religious, spiritual mold. You may agree with the man, you may not agree with the man. But we have to learn how to respond to someone who acts from a religious, spiritual mold, probably, probably, responding as he does from a religious spiritual mode may be very consistent with the kind of transformation that has been occurring in international relations for many years. Uh, but we, I am not here to talk about Haiti. What came to me when the council submitted, sent me their gracious invitation was to think that despite, despite the fact that the fact-finding fact profession originated in the Middle East. I tell my friends at CIA, they may think they are the best spooks, but spookism developed in the Middle East, and if they don't believe me, they should go and read in the Book of Numbers 
Moses ordering his men to, to spy the land of Canaan. <laughs> but in spite of the fact that spookism originated in the Middle East, for many years now, and if I may, may be permitted to use mixed metaphors, solid information has been hard to find when one thinks about the Middle East. Much of what has been said about the Middle East has been written either or said either by uncritical lovers of Arabs or Israelis or unloving critics of one side or the other. But things are changing. Things are changing. Things are changing. Uh, things are changing because one could say that, that going back to September 13 last year in Washington, the Declaration of Principles entered into between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We saw events moving, and events have been moving fast. It took vision for Rabin and Arafat and their lieutenants and their people. It took vision on their parts to get where they got to, the DOP, the Declaration of Principles. But ladies and gentlemen, what has been happening, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the order of the Arab-Israeli conflict has been dissolving more rapidly than a vision to replace it. It was a vision that led us to September 13, 1993. And here again, we may go back to the Holy Scriptures. And we may remember, we may remember Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. And what is needed now, and I know my friend Bob Friedman is here, Professor Friedman, Dean Friedman. We both work on, we have been working for years with a group called Search for Common Grounds. And part of our goal has been to bring Israelis, Arabs, and other conflicting parties together. While it's true we have to continue finding, searching for common grounds, we need to begin searching for a common vision. A common vision as to how peace will be. Governments have signed it. Leaders have been working on that. But what we need is that if we are to guess, if we are to analyze the outcome of September 13, 1993, and if we are to analyze the outcome, which I hope it is a positive outcome, of the Israeli-Syrian current discussions, then we have to be guided by, by a vision that both sides share. For a vision to work, it has to be shared by both sides. It cannot be imposed by one side over the other. Looking back at the Arab-Israeli conflict, back to 1948, we have seen many changes. For example, if one were to look at 1967, in 1967, in the war between the Arabs and the Israelis in 1967, Israel served notice to the Arabs that Israel is real. In the 1973 war between the Arabs and the Israelis, the Arabs served notice that Israel cannot impose its will upon the Arabs. And since 1973, both sides have been trying to adapt to those changing realities. And what has resulted has been what we have seen. What we have seen on September 13. 1993. Today, those of us who are working with conflict resolution and those of us working with Israelis and Arabs, 
we are now looking at how peace will look like. And let me take a brief few moments and focus on that. For a vision to develop regarding the Israelis and the Palestinians, such a vision has to incorporate a number of components. One critical component is a solution to the problem of Palestinians, the diaspora, the refugees, development. That has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with because unless we deal with that, we cannot really have a vision that both sides can share. What has become clear to those who signed the, the agreement on September 13, and to those of us cheering them, is that both sides have come to learn and accept that Israelis and Palestinians are there to stay. That the security and dignity of the Palestinian depends on the security and dignity of the Israeli, and that the security and dignity of the Israeli depends on the security and dignity of the other side. They have come, not, not all have recognized that. There are still many among the Palestinians and the Israelis who have not recognized that reality, but there are still others who, while they have recognized that reality, they do not have the, the, the ability yet, the emotional ability yet, to act upon that new knowledge. But both are there to stay. We cannot fool ourselves and hide behind diplomatic language. That vision has to incorporate the modality of ways and means for the Palestinians and the Israelis to stay there. And to recognize that the security of the State of Israel and the dignity of the Palestinian go hand in hand, cannot be separated cannot be separated. We have, we have seen the efforts in the past that have separated them. A second ingredient in the vision has to be cooperative projects to reduce distrust and to build relationships. That's, that has to happen. That has to happen on many levels. It has to happen on the level of textbooks in elementary schools, high schools, universities. It has to happen on the level of mercantilism, trade, professionalism. It cannot just be done by governments. Oftentimes we sit back and say, well, now we have signed the treaty, let, let them get together. It's going to take time. It's going to take time for both sides to develop the kind of trust. Because for many years, the Arab-Israeli conflict has been, has, been, has been a conflict in which we have seen the interlocking of Israeli fear with Arab anger. That has been the cycle, fear and anger interacting. And now we, are, we have to begin in this new vision to, to develop the kind of trust through cooperative projects. That has begun. If you visit Gaza, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, many European capitals, you will see American, Italian, Israeli, Saudi, and other bankers. And since we have a banker with us, we have, we have yes with us here, I sat with bankers in London talking, Israeli and, and Arab bankers talking about how they can develop joint projects. So it's going to happen. <laughs> now let me move more specifically. Questions you have on your mind, looking at the Palestinians. 
let me say to you with, 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 with certainty on my part that the peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians is irreversible. That doesn't mean that there is no opposition. There is opposition. There is opposition to Arafat. There is opposition to various aspects of the declaration. But the, what was signed in 1993, September 13, will continue. There's no return. There is no return. Some may wish that there's a return. There is opposition to Arafat. Question, how will Arafat handle it? Will he succeed? Answer, he will stay in power. Arafat has survived. Uh, he has survived the past. He will survive. Now the question becomes, how will he survive? Answer is very simple. He will survive by responding to the needs of the Palestinians living with, within the occupied territories and what, now what we call the Palestinian Authority and what is known as the West Bank Gaza. Meaning that there is going to evolve in that area, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. There is going to evolve unless there evolves a kind of a democratic structure a democratic structure that is not an emulation of Western democracies. Because here we sit and we, we somehow feel that, that forms and substance of democracy are one. And what we do, we at least in the United States, we equate the American form of democracy, political parties, pressure groups, and what have you with the essence of democracy. The essence of democracy is universal. The essence of democracy deals with human dignity, deals with participation in decision making. It deals with women, men, and children whose, whose welfare is being promoted. It deals with dissent that is respected. It deals with people participating in decision making. Now, for the Palestinians, for a Palestinian democracy to work, it has to include tribal components, if you please. It has to include religious components, if you please. It has to include cultural components. It can't work otherwise. And that's what they have to work out themselves. They have to be able to work with it. So the Arafat's, Arafat's life will depend, depend on his ability to put that, to be able to put it together. Now, good news about the Palestinians. One basic good news, here we are dealing with a people, a nation, a population, an authority, call it whatever you want, that has no debt. It has no billion dollars of debt to anyone. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> That's a good beginning for the Palestinians. They are not indebted. They don't have to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to finance their debts, to reschedule payments. That's good news. Second good news, no army. That's great. That's great. You know why it's great? This may shock you. For at least two decades, three decades, governments of the Middle East, Israel included, and others, have been spending almost 20% of their gross national product on arms. Some of them have been spending between 30 to 50% of their national budget on weapons. Their expenditures on arms have increased by an average of 10% a year, whereas their economic growth has not kept up with that. Their population increasing rapidly. 
So the news about the Palestinians not having an army is welcome news. We are encouraging them not to have one. Get out of that business. Get out of that business. Put your efforts in hospitals and schools and highways and parks for the children. Put your efforts in, in, in taking care of your elderly, but don't put it in weapons. Now, for you and me as good, solid Americans here, it pains me as another American to know that my country, my government, is the principal supplier of arms in the Middle East. It used to be the Russians, now that the Russians wouldn't want to do it. But who will give them dollars? The Russians insist <coughs> cash payment in hard currencies. It may, you may be, I'm sure you know that. Almost two thirds, almost two thirds of all the international trade in arms now goes to the Middle East. That's right. And I don't want to, to give you nightmares or feel sad. We, the USA, account for more than half of that. That's, 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 that's the fact. So they have no army. Third good news about the Palestinians. An educated population with no jobs. The Palestinians, the percentage of Palestinians holding college diplomas is the highest any place in the world. Here we are dealing with a highly skilled population. So hey, this is, Now let me move to the Syrians. My dear friend Bob Friedman said, Abdulaziz, if we don't talk about the Syrians, don't come. And despite my Scandinavian external appearance, my, fr my friend Bob Friedman said, if you don't talk about the Syrians, don't come. And despite my Scandinavian external appearance, I am Syrian. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Let me make five points about the scenes, then I will stop. Uh, <coughs> let's begin with Assad, the president of Syria. Assad is receptive to any ideas regarding a peace with Israel if it leads Assad to getting back the Golan Heights. Now, this may be an important statement or it may be an unimportant statement. When I say receptive, what may not be known about Assad, in 1973, Assad, March 1973, by then he had been president, he has been around for a while, he likes the job. In March 1973, Assad declared that he accepts the principle of peace with Israel. This was before the Golan. The Golan was taken later. <coughs> Provided it's predicated upon return of occupied territories. So that was way back. That was way back. But that was significant because he is on record saying peace for land for return of occupied territories. Attitudinally, that was important in 1973. But when we think about Assad, bear in mind a couple of things about Assad. Uh, Assad was the Secretary of Defense of Syria in 1967, when the Golan was occupied by the Israelis. That has, been, that has been a very real issue psychologically, emotionally, and intellectually with him. In fact, that has been the issue that has been erosive of his legitimacy. So to understand Assad's position, we have to place him in that context of 1967.
Now, today, where is Assad? I have been personally traveling between Damascus and here. And at times I have, at times I play a minor role as someone who transmits messages. Where Assad is at this time is trying to work with those segments of his army who are known as nationalists, Arab nationalists, to try to mobilize their support behind a peace agreement. So that's one thing he has to deal with. He has to deal with segments of his army. Uh, it, is, it is a lingering segment. It's a segment that is motivated by nationalist ideology. That doesn't mean that Assad doesn't have allies in the army. He does. But part of what he's working with is to mobilize those who still hold important positions. Assad also presently is dealing with certain operatives in the Ba'ath Party. The Ba'ath Party is the ruling party in Syria. Syria is a one-party system. There is within the Ba'ath Party a group of operatives. These are, these are Ba'athists, these are ideologues, who are not so much motivated by ideology, but these are Ba'athists who, who came to positions of importance on the coattails of Assad in the late 60s and early 70s, and who find in the maintenance of the status quo a service to their own interests that maintaining the conflict with Israel would serve their own interests. They don't want to see a change in the state quo. He's dealing with them. That's another group. Question then, why Syria? And what do you expect? If you, if you quote me, I will deny it. But uh, as late as last week, uh, I have been trying to get an answer from the Syrian government on a request that was sent to me by Dutch television. Dutch television said, we have heard that you go to Damascus. They came to Washington and said, we want to do us a favor. I said, what's a favor? They said, we have invited Barbara Streisand to come Christmas to Bethlehem. Great idea. Barbara Streisand. And we have invited Fayrouz, the famous Lebanese woman singer, to come also to Bethlehem and for them to sing together. I said, a great idea. <laughs> what can I do for you? Ah, they said. We went to Barbara. She said, she'll do it. We went to Fayrouz in Beirut, Lebanon. She said she would love to do it, but she needs an okay from the Syrians. Because as you know, the Syrians are in Lebanon. The Syrians are in control in Lebanon. So could you do us a favor and get us such an OK? <laughs> I said, not so easy. <laughs> Began this negotiation. Answer came. Dear Abdulaziz, you know, great idea. Tell them, not this Christmas, but next Christmas. <laughs> Tell you why I'm saying that. What is happening now between Syria and Israel is a very important process where both sides are doing a variety of things. Rabin is working with his leadership, preparing the Israelis. Syria is working, Assad is working with his leadership, preparing the Syrians. That's one thing they are doing. 
Now you may say, why do we need the Assyrians? Why do we need the Assyrians for anything? Answer. The Assyrians are the only Arabs who can defend a peace treaty with Israel. What I mean by that? The Syrians are the only Arab, Syria is the only Arab state that can, that can politically, politically defend a peace treaty with Israel in the eyes of the Arabs. Meaning if, the, if Syria signs it, it's legitimate, it's legit. It gives it legitimacy. We learned that in Washington. Egypt signed it, it didn't give it legitimacy. When si Camp David was signed, said, great, Camp David is done, we'll do it. Not much happened. Why does Syria occupy that role? It is an historic role. It is, it is an emotional role. It's a nationalist role. So the Syrians and their sides are working. What I see, and this is what I want to leave with you, both sides agree, Assad and Rabin, both agree that their window of opportunity is one year. This is why I mentioned Christmas next year. Their window of opportunity is one year. During this period, some of us have been making recommendations. As you know, the Israelis are stuck on one issue and the Syrians on another. This, the Syrians are stuck on the issue of they want withdrawal. The Israelis said are banishing the word W from their vocabulary. The, Syria, the Israelis want peace, meaning normalization of diplomatic relations, and the Syrians are banishing that. Meaning, what the Syrians and their sides are trying to do is to find modalities whereby in this window of opportunity, they will find ways where Assad will be satisfied. Going back to my first point, I, the idea that he will get the Golan back. Some modality. It doesn't matter for, not matter is not the right word. He is not saying it has to come back today, next year, the year after next. But a modality, a modality that begins by Israeli recognition of Syrian sovereignty over the Golan. And the Israelis are waiting for a modality from the Syrians about normalization of peace relations with Israel. As recently as two weeks ago, we saw words coming out from the Syrians and the Israelis. The Syrians, for the first time, mentioned the term warm peace, and meaning that this was the foreign minister of Syria in London. And the Israelis have been dropping hints, uh, recognizing sovereignty of Syria over the Golan. Uh, but beyond that, now what, what is attempted now is for the discussion between the Syrians and the Israelis to be carried on by two subcommittees. Not that they have accepted that. Neither side has accepted that. One subcommittee will handle the Syrian issue of withdrawal, uh, of peace, and find out how far Israel and Syria can go talking about that. The other subcommittee will handle what? The withdrawal, and to find out how far they can go with that. Then the two subcommittees will merge again. That's what we are recommending to them, those who are talking with them. Let me then conclude with Hebrews 11.1, 1, because you may ask me the question, how about the future? Is this man, as a line, like Carter, and I have the to tell you, I've had the pleasure of serving on his commission in 1978 when he created the Commission for the Islamic World. And my answer to you is to quote Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We have to have faith. Vision is not enough, but we have to have faith. Thank you. Uh, Assad's health, the questions about Assad's health. He has been invariably described as not being very healthy. Uh, he has been maintaining his health through, through medical and other, and a great deal of medical care. 
There is no indication at this time, and this is anyone's guess, that Assad will not be there for the immediate future. And by immediate future, I'm talking about the duration of what we are talking about next two, three years. Because as we talk about the peace process, we are talking now about a window of one year and beyond that, another window of three to five years. It takes time for, for agreements to evolve. What I failed to mention about the Palestinians, and some, some of you may ask the question, because as you know about the Palestinians, the DOP of September 13, 1993, did not move on schedule. There are no elections now. Uh, when will the elections be? Probably March or April. They were supposed to occur at this time. But they will occur, March or April. And I'm happy to also inform you that together with my friend Mubarak Awad, we have, we have gotten just a grant, uh, almost $100,000, to establish in Jerusalem a democratic center. Uh, and we are working on that. Uh, Mubarak Awad is a Palestinian leader who has been committed to nonviolence. He's known as Gandhi of the Palestinians. Your description of Arafat is pretty accurate. Probably to complete that accurate description is to also suggest that he has proven to be a pragmatist. Uh, he, will, he has been resisting, you are right, incorporating others in the decision-making process. Uh, earlier when I referred to will he succeed or will he not, his success, his future will depend upon his ability to do exactly what you said. Now, the good news is there are such Palestinians. They are among the brightest. Now, one thing that I am leaving for you to read here, anyone wants to read it, I have been involved in one project. Uh, I call it uh, Common Vision. And my project is very practical. It's to bring together mid-career military officers from select Arab states and Israel to sit together and design a mutually accepted military future, security future in the next 10 years. And to also put together another project to put together professionals, Israelis and Arabs, to design together a mutually acceptable partnership in trade and commerce. Meaning there are so many bright, talented people in the region that we have to begin to design cooperative projects. By cooperative projects, projects involving both sides that will design over the example. I would love to see a 21st century integrated, solar integrated community for the Palestinians in Gaza. It can be done when, when one puts together the resources and talents of both sides. Now, I have to tell you, and don't please, some of you may not like it, I'm not overjoyed with what I have been reading uh, big hotels to be built in Gaza. What they need in Gaza are not right now big hotels, big hotels for the future. What they need in Gaza is jobs, local businesses, local opportunities. That's what they need in Gaza. That's what they need in much of the Middle East. I get many people getting excited. They were meeting recently in Washington. Many people went, they were clapping. Great, we'll build five, six, ten more hotels. Okay, but that is not going to do it for the Palestinians. Not, that's not going to for the Gazans. So your point is well taken. Uh, my gut tells me, my gut tells me that Arafat understands that emotionally, uh, I, I'm sorry, understands that intellectually. But to act upon it emotionally will take time. I have worked with Arafat uh, together with uh, Gene Sharp from Harvard, Mubarak Awad, uh, and, uh, and Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolence. What we have been doing for them for several years is training them in nonviolence and training them in negotiation in Tunis, beginning back with 1978. Uh, 
And my experience of him is that he's a pragmatist. Uh, I think he would be able to manipulate his, his way. Because what I think, what has come to me talking with Palestinians inside Gaza, inside, inside Jericho, inside all over, they do not want a government in Palestine that is a replica or in any way similar to Amman, to Damascus, or even to Cairo. Because while, many, while, while, while the PLO has had a bad rap, and the, the PLO, for all of its, of its sins, has been the most open of the Arab political institutions. And the future of Arafat will depend on whether or not he can respond to the needs of the Palestinians living in. They are not going to accept a Palestinian authority patterned after Damascus. They have told me that. They have told that to many others. They said, we won't take it. We haven't suffered what we have suffered to be placed under such an authority. Talking to Israelis, the Israelis say, never, never, never again will we in any way be prevented from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, we are going to be there. So what, they are, what, they, what I hear the Israelis saying, are, they are saying many things, as a conflict resolution person. What I hear the Arabs saying also, we want to be in Jerusalem. Uh, we have Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. We have our holy places in Jerusalem. So we try to find a common ground between them. And again, Dr. Friedman and myself have been in the past talking about that. What are the modalities? Is it going to be a federal capital? Or is it going to be a Jerusalem whose Christian holy sites are under a specific Christian authority, who, whose Islamic sites under another authority, whose Jewish sites under another, and its administrative apparatus security would be under Israel? I'm, I'm talking about modalities. I'm in the business, as I mentioned earlier, of Hebrews 11.1. 1. And I'm in the business of Proverbs, trying to connect one with the other and going back to implementation. The jury is out on that. The jury is out. When I say the jury is out, what I'm saying is that indeed there are modalities. That may be harder than others. That may be harder. Uh, recently, however, and I have to say this, the, the behavior of King Hussein in Washington did not help a great deal. Uh, by, by laying claim <laughs> to Jerusalem, that did not help the cause. It didn't help the Palestinians. It, 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 uh, it, it created uh, a breaking of ranks among Arabs. Uh, that was ill-advised. He may have had to do it. After all, one billion dollars was, was being waved at him. Uh, uh, your Majesty, who knows? Congress may, may cancel your debt, close to a billion dollars. <laughs> Canceling one billion dollars and laying claim to Jerusalem. <laughs> I think the jury is out. Yeah. What I am saying myself, as someone in conflict resolution, we will keep talking about Jerusalem, but let's talk about areas that we can deal with. Uh, not areas that we can deal with. And that's a hard one at this time to deal with. I disagree with George Will, who on the 23rd of September described the fundamentalists in Algeria, snakes with rattlers. Ah, George. Oh, come on. Snakes with rattlers. Uh, what is happening in our media, and let me say at the outset, I am totally opposed to any fundamentalism, religious or political, because there are two forms. You and me are acquainted, usually we hear about the religious fundamentalism, which is what? Which is a, a, a denial of diversity, 
uh, a compulsion to return back, a refusal to, to accept change. That's religious fundamentalism. But it's political fundamentalism. But all fundamentalism, what, what does fundamentalism have in common? Fundamentalism, fundamentalism for me is a kind of, of pathology of a culture where a people under stress, I'm talking about now religious fundamental, under stress, they take, they take their, their set of beliefs and they reduce their beliefs to a, to a workable formula narrow f that works for them to protect themselves and isolate themselves from others. That's religious fundamentalism. Political fundamentalism is also a kind of cultural pathology where a people who, because they are on top, like we are Americans, they are the superpower, they impose their will on others. In both cases, because what we Americans do, we do politically, we take Western liberalism, and we reduce Western liberalism to a workable formula that works for us, and we say, hey, we are out to... Uh, fundamentalism of any kind is a disease. I always pray to God that I don't catch it. <laughs> it is an affliction. But what it is not, and what it ought not become to us, it ought not be the new communism, and to use it as bait if we want to to work with it, meaning our media and others are now elevating fundamentalism to be the new enemy. What is Islamic fundamentalism? Islamic fundamentalism is many things. Part of Islamic fundamentalism is totally radical and the total rejection of everything. Part of Islamic fundamentalism wants to take over. There are other Islamic fundamentalisms that are attempts on the part of Muslims who have been excluded from history for the last 200 years to try to return to history. Not to create a new empire, but to revive an old civilization. That's healthy. That's healthy. Nothing wrong with that. What we ought to do is, is not to lump them all together, to kind of understand the, the multifaceted types of fundamentalisms, and what our government ought to do, and I'm on record in the Washington Post, what we ought to do is to, for our government, to encourage governments in Islamic countries to participate in dialogue with fundamentalists who wish to participate. Not all of them, some of them don't. Because when their governments refuse to participate in dialogue with them, they drive them underground. Why do I say this? Because many of the issues raised by fundamentalists are legitimate issues. <coughs> Corruption of government, inefficiency, uh, dictatorship, you name it. And by following George, uh, not Will, uh, Jim Hoagland, snake letters as he calls them, what happens to, to, to people whom one describes as snake rattlers? They indeed then we'll go underground more and rattle more. So fundamentalism has to be looked at, not the way we looked at a monolith, it's not a monolith. Some of it is very healthy for them. In fact, what we ought to do with Muslims is what we are doing with Europe now, with Russia, with Eastern Europe. Work with them and support those governments so that Islam will regain its upper moral ground from the hands of the radical fundamentalist. We are doing that with the Russians. That's what we ought to be doing with them. Rather than say, no, no, don't. Don't have dialogue. So what, what I'm telling uh, Arab governments with whom I talk, I'm going to the Middle East next, next week, is they ought to learn lessons in dialogue. Has President Carter played any role in the behind-the-scenes negotiations with the Syrians, Israelis, and Americans, and Jordanians, and Lebanese? Answer, no. Uh, simple, no. Because President Clinton, I have voted for him. And being an academician, I speak with the utmost irresponsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I voted for the man. 
But President Clinton has concluded that he cannot alienate the American Jewish community. That's, he has decided that. But fine. So Carter, why does? Because Carter is anathema to many American Jews. He's anathema to them. And that's, that's part of the issue. Carter, I tell you why I'm saying this. I have gotten messages uh, and Mubarak Awad from Carter to help. Nothing. He has been in Arab countries. He talks, but Clinton keeps him at an arm's length. He is thinking of the next election. But I say to you, it is in the interest of all of us, Jews and Gentiles, Arabs and others, for the peace process to move on creatively. It's the interest of all of us. It's too serious to leave it in the hands of politicians. <laughs> Iran and Iraq, where do they fit? For the time being, Iran has ascribed to itself the role of the spoiler. Thank God, not effectively. But there is a role. Hezbollah in Lebanon is under Iranian control. And Iran is using Hezbollah in Lebanon to, to do what Hezbollah is doing vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Part of what is going behind the scenes right now Syrians and Israelis, is confidence building measures regarding Hezbollah. Is Syria willing to accept responsibility to control Hezbollah? If, if Syria is, Israel said, hey, let's talk about that. If you accept that responsibility, then maybe we Israelis will accept the responsibility of sending Colonel Lahoud, meaning the, the, the commander of the southern Lebanese forces, which is an Israeli created Lebanese army, send him back home to Beirut. And so we don't have those problems. They are talking about that behind the scenes. So Iran has that role, Hezbollah. But the other role of Iran, of spoiler, is supporting Islam, radical Islamic movements to undermine the process. Uh, how effective? So far, it has been more nuisance than effective. But don't dismiss it. Uh, recently in Saudi Arabia, you may, have, you may have been reading the news, the Saudis had to arrest hundreds of people who were involved in, in, it, in what the Saudi government describes as a fundamentalist threat to them. In Oman, the beautiful country of Oman, the Tibet, the Nepal of the Arab world, if you have not been to Oman, half of your life is wasted. Go to Oman. <laughs> and Oman welcomes everyone. As you know, the Oman has invited the Israelis to go there recently, and many Arabs got angry with them. Uh, in Oman, and Oman is, a, is one of the much, one of the open Arab countries, politically, a threat against the Omani government by fundamentalists. And they have had to arrest hundreds of them, too. So there is that. You have to bear that in mind. Uh, but beyond that, beyond that, my sense tells me uh, the, the, that the, the peace process will continue. There's no reversal. But there is that you have to back that for this time. It's out of the picture. But the Iraqis are beginning to, are initiating, initiating, trying to initiate conversation with the Israelis. They are trying to return back to the fold of nations. Personally, as if someone in conflict resolution, I encourage dialogue with them. Because if we are to have security in the region, collective security, we cannot exclude Iran or Iraq. There cannot be a collective security system without both of them. The question becomes, at what price? That's, that's a tough question. Uh, what are going to be the voting rights of the Israeli settlers in Palestinian territory and Palestinians, uh, you didn't tell, Palestinians in Israel vote. I mean, they, uh, I mean, Palestinians in Israel have voting rights. If they are Israeli citizens, and they are, and they, 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 they are members of parliament. Uh, that has not been resolved yet. Uh, what is being talked about and resolved at this time, it will be universal suffrage. Uh, and I am convinced it's going to be universal suffrage, uh, men, women, uh, throughout that that is going to happen 
in the Palestinian areas. But the issue of the, uh, of course, the other issue of Jerusalem too has not, the, the Palestinians living in Jerusalem, where do they vote? Yeah. That's, that's part of your question, which is now being talked about. I haven't met him myself about Assad, a profile of Assad. I have not met him, but let me tell you what I surmise. I surmise that we are dealing with a pragmatist, a nationalist, an Arab nationalist, uh, that we are dealing with someone who at his age at this time wants to make a mark that he made a difference. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that he has not committed all the sins that has been ascribed to him. He has. Uh, because I, among other things, I'm a human rights freak. And uh, I am now involved in convincing the Syrian government I haven't succeeded yet. And they are talking with me about it, to their credit, of, of, of organizing a human rights conference in Damascus. And they haven't said no. There was a time they say, Come to us the year 2020. <laughs> no, they said, they said, they said well, let's talk about it. There's a change. For a marvelous evening, uh, we're in your debt. Not only was it a, a, uh, uh, an interesting view, and your, your general understanding is one we appreciate, but the variety of insights which you've shared with us I think were quite unusual. And I think that everyone shares your, your, uh, your quest. And we wish you the very, very best in that.